who was Ralph Waldo Emerson. Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1803-1882, was the leading 19th-century American transcendentalist. His essays and activism not only established him as an intellectual for his time, but also provided a model for subsequent American intellectuals, particularly the pragmatists. Emerson's main writings, which are still read today most are free online include Nature, 1836, his first book, which contains the essays Nature, Commodity, Beauty, Language, Discipline, Idealism, Spirit, Prospects, The American Scholar, Divinity School Address, Literary Ethics, The Method of Nature, Man the Reformer, Introductory Lecture on the Times, The Conservative, The Transcendentalist. And The Young American, there is also Essays, First Series, 1841, Containing History, Self-Reliance. Compensation, Spiritual Laws, Love, Friendship, Prudence, Heroism, The Oversoul, Circles. Intellect and Art, and Essays, Second Series, 1844, which includes the poet, experience, character, manners, gifts, nature, politics, nominalist and realist, and New England reformers. Other books include poems, 1847, Miscellanies, Embracing Nature, Addresses, and Lectures. 1849, Representative Man, 1850, Including Essays on Plato and Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. English Traits, 1856, which is about his travels, The Conduct of Life, 1860. The Poetry Collection Mayday and Other Pieces, 1867, and Society and Solitude, 1870. Emerson's last series of essays were lectures given at Harvard University. In 1871 and posthumously published as Natural History of Intellect, 1904. There is also the correspondence of Thomas Carlyle and R. W. Emerson, 1883. What did Arthur Schopenhauer mean by his acronym WELT? Schopenhauer thought the omnipresence of will was an endless cause of suffering. He even created an acronym to express this with the word WELT, or WORLD. The letters in WELT stood for WE, WO, ELEND, MISERY, LAID, SUFFERING, and TOD, DEATH. Schopenhauer thought that the only way out of this was to give up will by affirming the noble truths of Buddhism. Life is suffering, desire causes suffering, eliminating desire eliminates suffering. Desire can be eliminated only through a saintly life, which requires chastity, humbling of the body, and extreme poverty. What is feminism and feminist philosophy? Feminism involves both thought and practice aimed at improving the well-being of women. 
On the side of practice it is often thought of as the women's movement. Intellectually, feminism is a critical theory because it contains analysis of social conditions and prescriptions for improving them toward its end. Also on the intellectual side, feminism is now a multidisciplinary academic field with participation from all of the humanities. Contemporary cultural criticism, the social sciences, and women's studies. Feminist philosophy is the philosophical dimension of intellectual feminism. Many feminist philosophers understand their intellectual history and the history of the women's movement in terms of three waves. What, besides ethics, is philosophical about environmentalism? As mortal beings, we are all dependent on our environments. And a good part of human spirituality is centered on gratitude for how the earth supports human life. As well as the beauty of natural living and non-living things. Overall, environmentalism has encouraged a reverence for the goods of life and a good life that flows from what is not artificial or man-made and mass-produced. There are, of course, direct practical human concerns when it comes to environmentalism. As well as quality of life issues related to diminishing resources. For example, not all of the multidisciplinary experts who have studied global warming agree on its dangers or on how much of it is due to human fossil fuel consumption. Some believe that Earth has had similar changes in temperature before human industrialization. Recent and emerging studies assign high percentages of global warming to the flatulence of domestic animals raised for food, which could be considered an indirect human activity. Sorting out an issue as complex as global warming would require extensive philosophy of science. What was Scottish common sense philosophy? It was the realist view of human knowledge put forth by Thomas Reed. 1710-1796, that what we know are real objects in the world and not our ideas, as claimed by David Hume, 1711-1776. Who was Alfred North Whitehead? Alfred North Whitehead, 1861-1947, was famous in analytic philosophy for his collaboration with his student Bertrand Russell. 1872-1970, on Principia Mathematica, three volumes, 1910, 1912, 1913. Principia took almost ten years to complete and was highly regarded as an Impressive but ultimately unsuccessful attempt to reduce mathematics to logic. Whitehead was also the American originator of process philosophy, a version of philosophy of science and metaphysics that is similar to pragmatism in its emphasis on change and the dynamic nature of experience.
How was Newton's system received? Newton's, 1642-1727, laws were accepted with intellectual awe, bordering on reverence. Part of this reaction was gratitude for the comprehensive way in which he plausibly united both the atomic theory and the results of the Copernican revolution. Newton was famous for his claim of not going beyond the evidence. His motto was hypotheses non fingo, or I frame no hypotheses. However, this was not literally true, given his scolium that assumed absolute space and time. And his postulation of force as action at a distance. He also assumed that God existed. But Newton's stance of empiricism he thought. For example, that with sufficiently powerful microscopes it would be possible. To see Adams someday carried the day on the issue of whether he really was an empiricist. Newton's work was almost immediately translated into European languages and became the new view of the universe. There were also popularized versions of his ideas. And by the early 18th century idealized portraits of him were in wide circulation. Francesco Algarotti published Newton for the Ladies in 1737, which was reprinted in many editions. Because girls did not receive the same education as boys. It was widely believed that scientific knowledge had to be simplified and expressed in more gentle language for women. How were virtue ethics rediscovered in analytic philosophy? Aristotelian virtue ethics, mainly as expressed in Aristotle's 384-322b. C. Nicomachene ethics were revisited in analytic philosophy to create rationalist moral systems. According to Aristotle, we develop our individual virtues through a rational process of deliberating and then choosing what to do in action. The revival of Aristotelian ethics was sometimes pursued in Opposition to other prominent moral systems and moral theories. Philippa Foote, 1920, and Alastair McIntyre, 1929, are noteworthy 20th century virtue ethicists. What was Henry David Thoreau's philosophical contribution? Henry David Thoreau, 1817-1862, was a naturalist, writer, school teacher, and pencil maker, he invented the pencil with an eraser on its end. He was born in Concord, Massachusetts, attended Harvard, and then returned to Concord. He was not a political reformer but is famous for his civil disobedience in not paying the poll tax, he felt it supported slavery and the Mexican-American War. Both of which he found objectionable, and for helping runaway slaves escape. Thoreau is best known for the two years he spent in a hut he built on Walden Pond. An experience he describes in Walden, 1854. His lifestyle there and protest against materially driven lives of quiet desperation. 
set an aesthetic ideal for many American intellectuals in generations to come. Thoreau's love of nature and ideals of simplicity were in themselves a form of revolt against industrial life and have been reclaimed in intellectual revolts against post-industrial life. However, Thoreau's striking intellectual contribution is not the ideal of roughing it in nature. Because his time at Walden Pond, punctuated as it was by frequent visits from his literary friends, as well as his own habit of walking back into town, was hardly a withdrawal from society. Indeed, the hardships he endured scarcely compared with the hardships of pioneers and homesteaders farther west, who lived in rural poverty out of necessity rather than choice. By contrast, Thoreau set a different example for a different American group of strivers. He combined a naturalistic aesthetic of simplicity with cultural criticism and intellectual creativity. This life of the mind in the woods stands in stark social class and regional contrast to the genuinely hard scrabble background of several of the early 20th century pragmatists, as well as with their efforts. Did 19th century American philosophers directly take up evolution? Yes. Both John Fiske, 1842 to 1901, and Chauncey Wright, 1830 to 1875, believed in the evolution of consciousness and human morality. Fiske was best known as an historian for his two-volume The American Revolution, 1891. Wright was an empiricist philosopher of science who opposed transcendentalism and was to be influential in subsequent pragmatist thought, although he himself published very little. Lester Ward, 1841-1912, was a sociologist best known for dynamic sociology. 1883, but his main ideas in favor of intervention in social evolutionary processes proved to be relevant for future social and political philosophy. What was Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative? Kant is usually interpreted to have two formulations. First, act so that the maxim of your action, or the generalization describing it, can be willed by you to be a general rule, to be followed by all rational agents. In other words, only do those things that you as a benevolent, rational being can will that everyone do. The test of a categorical imperative is what happens if everyone follows it. Something that has good consequences in a particular case might not have good consequences in all cases. For example, if the maxim is obey traffic rules, and you come to a red light with no other cars in attendance. You may not drive through it even though the consequences in this particular case would be benign. Or, to use an example of Kant's, if the maxim is not to lie, and a madman is looking for a friend of yours whose whereabouts you know, you may not lie in this case. Because overall you can't benevolently will that everyone be permitted to lie whenever the consequences are good for them.
To take another example of cans, you may not take your own life. No matter how miserable you are, because you categorically can't will suicide as a good action. What is a scientific revolution according O. Thomas Kuhn? A scientific revolution, said Kuhn, 1922 to 1996, is preceded by a time of crisis in which the leading paradigm is no longer able to guide investigation and produce new discoveries in the field. A competing paradigm arises that is able to both explain the data accounted for in the old paradigm and explain new data. Eventually, the new paradigm wins, because its adherents get control of the field in question. Along with their victory comes the authority to rewrite the textbooks so that the entire history of the science can be viewed as leading up to the new paradigm. Most of the practitioners of the old paradigm do not change their minds but literally leave the field, either through retirement or death. The new paradigm then establishes a new era of normal science that persists until the next revolution. What did Pope Honorius III consider heretical about Johannes Scotus Eri Eugenius treatise? In De Divis Ioni Naturi Eri Eugenia presented a Neoplatonic view of the world and cosmos that was also pantheistic. The Catholic Church did not accept pantheism, which held that God was everywhere in the world. Because he was supposed to be separate from his creation. According to Eri Eugenia, we cannot ascribe any natural quality from our own experience to God. That view was not a problem for the Pope. The problem was that he described the created world as emanating from God in different stages. God created ideas or platonic forms, and these created perceptible objects. The perceptible objects could not create anything but instead would ultimately be one with God. Which meant that God was all in all, part of a circle that ended in himself. What has been important in second wave feminist political philosophy? The concept of patriarchy, or rule by fathers, throughout human history sparked much social and textual analysis. Which was brought to theoretical completion by Carol Pateman in The Sexual Contract, 1988. Pateman argued that when modern social contract theory was constructed by Thomas Hobbes, 1588-1679, and John Locke, 1632 to 1704, women were left out of the political equation and relegated to private life. Iris Young, 1949 to 2006, a professor of philosophy at the University of Chicago, addressed the connection between female social roles and political structures in. Justice and the Politics of Difference, 1990, and Inclusion and Democracy, 2000. Young also addressed women's disempowered bodily comportment in her 1980 essay Throwing Like a Girl.
included in a book by the same name in 1990. In addition, feminist philosophers have welcomed and discussed the work of University of Michigan Law School professor Catherine McKinnon. How did Spinoza's system solve Cartesianism? Descartes' division between mind and body depended on the existence of two separate substances. Mind and material body, in addition to God. For Spinoza, there was but one substance, which was also God. That is, the human mind and the human body are the same exact thing, but are understood in different ways. We do not think of one thing as interacting causally with itself. So Cartesianism could not even get started as a problem in Spinoza's system. What were the new logic and four types of idols made famous by Francis Bacon's Novum Organum? In his New Atlantis, 1627, Francis Bacon, 1561-1626 Described a social organization for scientific research. His Novum Organum, 1620, presented a new logic of induction. Which would take the place of both Aristotelian logic and a simple collection of facts. The aim was to discover real natural laws or reliable generalizations about aspects of nature. Bacon's system became famous for the obstacles to acquiring such knowledge, which he described as four kinds of idols. First were idols of the tribe or natural tendencies of thought such as a search for purposes in nature or reading human desires and needs onto natural things and events. The second were the idols of the cave or the idiosyncrasies and biases of individuals due to their education. Social background, association, and the authorities they favored. The third type were idols of the marketplace or meanings of words taken for. Granted when the words themselves did not stand for anything that existed in reality. And, finally, the idols of the theater were the influence. Of theories that had already been widely accepted. Why did Martin Heidegger refuse having his works translated from the German language? Heidegger had a strong bias in favor of German as the language of thought. He did not think that his philosophy could be understood by those who did not speak German and would not permit his work to be translated into Spanish. What was Mary Estelle's contribution to early modern philosophy? Mary Estelle 1666 to 1731 used Descartes ideas to criticize custom insisting that tradition itself is not a sufficient justification for the subordinate position of married women she wrote 
that the custom of the world, has put women, generally speaking, into a state of subjection, is not denied, but the right can no more be proved from the fact. Then the predominancy of vice can justify it. This willingness to criticize custom in the service of an unpopular claim was an important intellectual innovation. Estelle was interested in the use of reason as an innate capacity of women. She argued that women could find their own religious salvation, intellectually as well as morally. The target of her argument was the prevailing practice of not offering women the same education as men. In her A Serious Proposal to the Ladies, 1694, she proposed a college for upper class women that would prepare them for intellectual activities and religious services. Her claim was that the faults attributed to women could be corrected through education. What was Robert Boyle's atomic theory? Boyle, 1627-1691, claimed that the things in the world studied in physics, chemistry, biology, and inquiries into gases and fluids were all made up of atoms. He thought that because atoms could be used to explain and predict what was observable. Their existence was an empirical matter and not the results of pure speculation. Unlike Gas Andy, who was content to suspend judgment on whether atoms existed. Boyle claimed that atoms did exist, using the method of transdiction. Did Mikhail Bakunin get along with Karl Marx? Bakunin and Marx were bitter enemies. Marx campaigned to expel Bakunin from the International Working Men's Association. The tempestuous relationship between Marx and Bakunin is a well-known part of the history of Western Socialism. As a co-member of the International Working Men's Association, Marx referred to Bakunin as a man devoid of all theoretical knowledge. Bakunin said that Marx was from head to foot an authoritarian. T. He instinct of liberty is lacking in him. Although Marx said that Bakunin was in his element as an intriguer, it was Marx who in 1848 published an untrue rumor, begun by the Russian ambassador, that Bakunin was a Russian agent responsible for the arrest of Poles. Who was William Hamilton? William Hamilton, 1788-1856, was a professor at Scotland's University of Edinburgh. He is famous for his philosophy of the conditioned in Scottish common sense philosophy. He agreed with Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, that we cannot know things in themselves. But also with Thomas Reed, 1710 to 1796, about naturalism. Reed's idea that we know things in the world directly and Kant's 
idea that we do not know things in themselves are contradictory. Hamilton believed that they could be mysteriously combined through intuition. John Stuart Mill, 1806-1873, in an examination of Sir William Hamilton's philosophy, 1865. Vigorously attacked Hamilton's notion that scientific principles are intuitively valid. Rather than valid on account of their ability to provide causal explanations, as Mill thought. What was unusual about Hume's theory of the emotions? Although Hume exalted reason over faith when it came to knowledge. When it came to human psychology he believed that we are primarily motivated by our emotions. Or passions and that reason is always in the service of these emotions. That is, unlike Benedict de Spinoza, 1632-1677, he did not have a cognitive theory of the emotions. According to which what we feel is the result of what we believe. Hume wrote, reason is, and ought only to be, the slave of the passions. What is phenomenalism? Not to be confused with phenomenology, phenomenalism is the empiricist doctrine that sense data or the sensory organs impression of perception could be used to explain the meaning of sentences about perceptual objects. Some believe that perceptual objects themselves such as a computer, a desk, or a car could be reduced to sense data. This last ontological version of phenomenalism would involve a general commitment to philosophical idealism or the doctrine that the only things that are real are mental phenomena. Why was John Stuart Mill important? John Stuart Mill, 1806-1873, is to this day studied most for his work on ethics, which codified utilitarianism. One of the three major philosophical moral systems, along with virtue ethics and deontology. However, he had important political influence, too, as a British progressive and also codified the empirical philosophy of science. His contributions to both democratic progress and the philosophy of science were so influential that they are often taken for granted politically and in definitions of science. Without a perceived need to trace their authorship, What was W? V. O. Quine's view of existence? He is famous for claiming, to be is to be the value of a variable. He meant by this that we should be committed to the existence of only those. Entities that need to be posited in order to understand and apply scientific theories. He wrote, For my part I do, quale amateur physicist, believe in physical objects and not in Homer's gods. 
and I consider it a scientific error to believe otherwise. But in point of epistemological footing, the physical objects and the gods differ only in degree and not in kind. Both sorts of entities enter our conceptions only as cultural posits. Why was Bernardo Telesio called the first of the moderns by Francis Bacon? Bernardo Telesio, 1509-1588, studied philosophy, physics and mathematics at the University of Padua. Receiving his doctorate at the age of 26. His subsequent pedagogical activity consisted of conversations with friends under the patronage of the Carafa family in Naples. He was also sought after by Pope Gregory XIII, 1502-1585, who invited him to Rome. Telesio's major work was on the nature of things according to their principles. Telesio's innovation was to propose that knowledge of nature be based on sensory information about matter and the forces of heat and cold. Because of this emphasis on sensory information, Telesio is credited with laying the groundwork for more rigorous ideas about scientific investigation. Which would soon follow in the work of Francis Bacon, 1561 to 1626, and Galileo Galilei, 1564 to 1642. However, Telesio's own theories about the workings of nature do not greatly depart from Neoplatonic perspectives. According to Telesio, heat, represented by sky is the source of life and the cause of biological functions. Cold is represented by earth, and it opposes heat. Heat also emanates spirit, which in animals and humans is located in the brain. For the purpose of anticipating and receiving sensory information. Man also has an animus superadita, or mind, which is created by God and present in both spirit and body. All beings have a desire or impetus toward self-preservation, which in human beings includes a goal of everlasting life. Who was St. What stories did Hobbes contemporaries tell about him? According to the biography of Hobbes written by his contemporary John Aubrey. When Hobbes was at Oxford, he used to get up early in the morning. And venture forth with lead weights, pack threads, and pairings of cheese. He would smear the threads with bird lime, an adhesive substance used to trap birds by sticking their feet to something, and bait them with the cheese. Jackdaws would spy them from far away and strike at the bait. Young Hobbs would then haul in the string and the weights would cling to the bird's wings. Aubrey does not furnish details about what happened after that. After the plague of 1665 and the Great Fire of London in 1666, people sought reasons for God's wrath. Parliament passed a bill to suppress atheism and a committee was constituted to investigate Hobbes' Leviathan. There was a report that Hobbes had been burned in effigy. 
and Hobbes was afraid that his papers would be searched, so he himself burned part of them. The king, who liked Hobbes, intervened, but from then on Hobbes was not permitted to publish his work. Neither the Roman Catholic Church nor Oxford University permitted his books to be read. And they occasionally even burned them. What is Marxism? Marxism is the doctrine attributed to Karl Marx, 1818-1883. That human society is divided into social classes and that the material or economic struggles among classes are the most important events on the big stage of history. What was Alastair MacIntyre's contribution to virtue ethics? Alastair MacIntyre, 1929, has approached ethics with a rejection of both Marxism and late 20th century consumer capitalism. In his return to Thomistic Aristotelianism, or Aristotelianism influenced by the altruistic and religious values of Christianity, he considers the nature of moral argument about competing systems and has reclaimed Edith Stein, 1891-1942. McIntyre views virtues as moral qualities needed to fulfill human potential. He has focused on the combination of practice, virtue, and tradition, practice is communal action. Virtue is the individual dispositions and habits that are necessary to participate in practice. Tradition is the history of a community as an object of reflection. McIntyre thus thinks that virtues develop and are practiced in communities. And that moral communities must be understood in terms of their history. McIntyre's view is not intended to be conservative in a social or political sense. But is instead developed as an understanding of Aristotelian virtues that would not have been possible without the fact of all the history that has ensued since Aristotle wrote. In a nutshell, what did Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels write in their philosophy? Human beings must work to live. History, noted Marx and Engels, is a Hegelian dialectical process in which different divisions of labor have developed. Resulting in the 19th century in a bourgeois owning class that controls the government and an exploited proletariat, or working class, that furnishes the labor for capitalists. Capitalism is an economic system in which owners seek profits through ever-expanding production and markets. Their profit is the result of subtracting the costs of material and equipment. Or capital, plus wages paid to workers, from the money they take in. Within the producing system, labor, or the work of the working class results in a surplus value, because workers are exploited by employers. The worker is paid just enough to go home and eat, sleep, and engage in familial acts of reproduction. 
which altogether reproduce his labor so that he can continue to function as a worker. That is, every aspect of the worker's life is squeezed by their employers so that they can maximize their profits. The result is that workers, especially those who made up the vast pool of labor in 19th century industrial society, were poor. What is Latin American philosophy? Latin American philosophy is either or both the thought of philosophers who reside in Latin American countries or the newer work of Latino Latina slash Hispanic American philosophers. Like African American and Native American philosophy, it is a subfield to the academic discipline that formed after 1930 although it was not duly recognized until after 1980. Contemporary Considerations of Philosophy in Latin America Written by philosophers who also reflect on the Latino-Latina slash Hispanic American. Experience include the following books, Linda Alcoff and Eduardo Mendieta. Thinking from the Underside of History, Enrique de Sell's Philosophy of Liberation, 2000, Jorge J. E. Gracia, Maria Camurathy, Editors. Philosophy and Literature in Latin America, 1989, Jorge J. E. Gracia and Elizabeth Millensabert. Editors, Latin American Philosophy for the 21st Century, The Human Condition, Values and the search for identity 1989 eduardo mendieta global fragments critical theory latin america and globalizations 2007 susanna nuxatelli latin american thought philosophical problems and arguments 2002 and ophelia shut cultural identity and social liberation in latin american thought 1993 How well do old philosophers receive new philosophers? This is, of course, not a matter of the age of philosophers. The old tradition remains robust. And its practitioners have repudiated each of these new philosophies as not real philosophy. Still, as their practitioners secure posts in philosophy departments, which they increasingly do, that dismissal becomes untenable. If someone who has been trained by philosophers publishes work in philosophy journals or books, is hired to teach philosophy, and identifies as a philosopher, that person is as much a philosopher as the bird that waddles, quacks, and swims is a duck. The point is that philosophers customarily disagree and repudiate each other's thoughts when they are among friends. So one would expect no less than this kind of reaction to the new philosophies who have diverged from the mainstream. Did John Stuart Mill have much chance to indulge in the pleasure principle as he grew up? The pleasure principle was certainly not applied to Mill's young life in the same sense as Jeremy Bentham's. 
1748-1832, formulation, although it possibly was in Mill's more nuanced version of utilitarianism. Which distinguished between higher and lower pleasures. Mill's father, James, with help from his friend Bentham, educated the young Mill at home. Young John knew Greek at three, Latin at five, logic by twelve, and economics by sixteen. He was also deeply schooled in a social mission to increase the good for the greatest number through progressive political programs. Mill had a nervous breakdown at twenty. Biographers believe that his Highly structured and rigorous childhood education was the cause of an emotional imbalance. The humanities had been neglected in his education. And his social interactions with peers were limited by the demands of his studies. Mill then began a course of study in literature to develop his more humanistic sensibilities. He read Romantic Poetry and Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And he began to rethink Bentham's simple hedonic calculus. The result was Mill's famous distinction between higher and lower pleasures and a scathing assessment. Of Bentham's character as oblivious and uncultured, Bentham, an essay first published in the London and Westminster Review in 1838, and revised in 1859 for his own dissertations and discussion, Volume 1. Was Rousseau a hypocrite? Based on his assumption that children were naturally good and that the purpose of education was to nurture this goodness. Jean Jacques Rousseau, 1712-1778, became the leading educational theorist of his age. His Emile, or, On Education, is a loving account of the development of a young boy under the guidance of Rousseau. The boy is raised in the countryside, where there are less corrupting influences and his mind is not taxed. Until he is twelve. This is a progressive education set up to draw out the nature of the child. Nature wants children to be children before being men. Childhood has its own ways of seeing, thinking, and feeling. Emile then learns a skill carpentry. And at 16 he is introduced to Sophie, who has been selected as his maid. Sophie has been educated to be governed, whereas Emile is taught the principles of self-government. Rousseau himself is said to have had five children by Therese Levasseur. And each one was brought to an orphanage at birth. Those individuals who already hated Rousseau, such as Voltaire, 1694-1778, pointed out that most children in orphanages at that time perished. Rousseau's only defense was that he did not think he would have been a good father. When a friend of Rousseau's noted that the course of education described in Emile was not practical, Rousseau wrote back, you say quite correctly that it is impossible to produce an Emile. But I cannot believe that you take the book that carries this name for a true treatise on education. It is rather a philosophical work on this principle advanced. By the author in other writings that man is naturally good. If Rousseau did not take himself seriously as an educational theorist, 
then his own behavior as a parent would not have meant that he was a hypocrite on that score. The question, however, remains whether this behavior qualifies him as naturally good. So the question of hypocrisy does not go away that easily. What is known about Leibniz's life? Gottfried Leibniz, 1646-1716, was born in Leipzig, Germany. His mother was the daughter of a professor, and his father was a professor. His father died when he was. 6. Leibniz studied philosophy and law at the University of Leipzig, but he was too young to be awarded. A doctorate in law when he finished at age 20. He then moved to Altdorf, where he graduated and was offered a professorship that he turned down to become secretary of the Rosicrucian Society in Nuremberg. He then entered the service of Johann Philipp von Schönborn, Elector of Mainz. And during this time he did not produce his own philosophy but mainly wrote histories and biographies for pay. In 1672 Leibniz went to Paris. And after four years he entered the service of Johann Friedrich, Duke of Hanover. When Johann died, he served Ernst August, 1629-1698, Duke of Hanover, and then George Ludwig, who became King George I of Great Britain in 1714. He was commissioned by Ernst August to write the History of the House of Brunswick in 1685. After traveling to Munich, Vienna, and Italy, he showed as part of his commissioned writing assignment, how Brunswick was connected with the House of Este. Leibniz had a close correspondence with Ernst August's wife, Sophie, and her daughter, Sophie Charlotte, who became Queen of Prussia. He became president of the Berlin Society of Sciences in the same city where Sophie Charlotte lived. After her death, her family was not welcoming to him. Perhaps because they had resented his relationship with her while she was alive. Leibniz was continually involved in efforts to promote communication and cooperation in scientific research, both theoretical and practical. He also had hopes that all Christians might unite. He was honored with prestigious government posts in Vienna, 1712-1714. But by the time of his death his royal patrons, and most of the intellectuals who had known him, abandoned him. They did so for several reasons, Isaac Newton was favored in Leibniz's dispute with him. Leibniz no longer had the protection of Sophie Charlotte, and his philosophical work was not popular. Neither the Royal Society nor the Berlin Academy saw fit to honor him after he died. King George I was nearby when his funeral was held but did not deign to attend or send a representative. Leibniz's grave remained unmarked for almost 50 years until a descendant of Sophie Charlotte took up the cause of rehabilitating his memory. While it is not clear how damaging his dispute with Isaac Newton, 1643-1727, over the discovery of the calculus was to his reputation and standing, it evidently proved more harmful to him than it did to Newton. 
Newton had claimed that Leibniz plagiarized his work on the differential calculus. When Leibniz died, he was engaged in writing a religious work about Chinese philosophy and the Leibniz Clark correspondence in which he attacked virtually every aspect of Newton's metaphysical system. What is American philosophy? The term American philosophy most often refers to the school of pragmatism, which began in the late 19th century. Pragmatism is internationally recognized to be a distinct form of philosophy. Not only created by philosophers from the United States, but also reflective of American culture. There were, of course, intellectuals in the United States before the pragmatists. And some of their work was highly original, linked to distinct cultures, 17th, 18th, and 19th century political theorists, abolitionists, suffragists, evolutionists. Native American thinkers, American Hegelians, and New England transcendentalists. Many American philosophers after the pragmatists have worked within analytic, empirical, continental, and postmodern traditions, as well as later forms of pragmatism. American philosophy, broadly understood as an intellectual aspect of culture, would include all of these fields. However, American philosophy, as systematic philosophy, traditionally understood, narrows the subject down. Why have existentialist philosophers claimed Dostoevsky as one of their own? The great Russian novelist Fyodor Mihailovich Dostoevsky, 1821-1881, is considered an inspiration to the modern philosophical tradition of existentialism because of the depth of his appreciation for the difficulty of the human condition and the universal problems he and his fictional characters agonized over. Friedrich Nietzsche 1844-1900 said that Dostoevsky was the only psychologist from whom I have something to learn. He praised Dostoevsky's notes from the underground, 1864, for having cried truth from the blood. Indeed, in Notes from the Underground Dostoevsky introduces a self-deprecating narrator who became an iconic anti-hero for subsequent existentialist writers. The narrator's first words are, I am a sick man, and his ensuing reflections, rantings, and ruminations make it clear that the sickness at issue is primarily a malaise of the soul. Not the least of the sickness is a disgust with reason. Although Dostoevsky is well known for valorizing simplicity in religious faith, he did not arrive at that viewpoint easily, either in works of fiction such as Crime and Punishment, 1866, or in his own life. In his masterpiece, The Brothers Karamazov, 1881, Ivan is an atheist while his brother, Elisha, is studying to become a monk. In the famous Grand Inquisitor dialogue within this novel, Ivan presses Elisha on his faith. 
going to the heart of the matter in asking how a good God can permit the suffering of innocent children. Ivan recounts the story of a peasant's child whom the Lord allows his dogs to tear apart. Because the child threw a stone at one of them. The character of Elisha is said to be modeled on Dostoevsky's close friend. The Russian philosopher Vladimir Sergeyevich Solovyov, 1853-1900. Who longed to reunite the Roman Catholic and Russian Orthodox churches? Who was Henry Moore? Henry Moore, sixteen fourteen to sixteen eighty seven was the great-grandson of the martyred English Chancellor, Sir Thomas More. Henry enrolled in Christ College, Cambridge, at the age of 17, and remained there his entire life. He became a fellow in 1641. His distinctive mission was to eradicate, or cure, atheism and enthusiasm, which he called two enormous distempers of the mind. He sought to convert philosophers to the Christian faith, as he understood it. And his interests included Neoplatonism, reports of witches and ghosts, science, and René Descartes, 1596-1650, philosophy. He differed with Descartes, however, in insisting that animals have souls. He attacked Thomas Hobbes, 1588-1679, and Benedict de Spinoza, 1632-1677, for their presumed atheism. He was a tutor to Cambridge Platonist and Conway, 1630-1679. And deplored her enthusiastic conversion to Quakerism. He is said to have coined the terms Cartesianism and materialist. Henry Moore's writings included a history of the English Jesuits, translations, and his life and doctrines of our Saviour Jesus Christ, 1660. Was Ralph Waldo Emerson an abolitionist? Yes, but it took him a while to develop his position. From childhood, he thought that slavery was evil, but he relied on persuasion rather than outright opposition to it until 1837. At that time he was shocked by the murder of Elijah P. Lovejoy, an abolitionist publisher in Illinois. By 1844 he said of the abolitionists, we are indebted mainly to this movement. And to the continuers of it, for the popular discussion of every point of practical ethics. After that, he was considered a strong voice for abolition, the Atlantic magazine which also published essays by the African-American intellectual Frederick Douglass printed these words by Emerson. Referring to the slave-owning and free American states, in 1862, we have attempted to hold together two states of civilization. A higher state, where labor and the tenure of land and the right of suffrage are democratical. And a lower state, in which the old military tenure of prisoners or slaves, and of power and land in a few hands, makes an oligarchy. But the rude and early state of society does not work well with the later, nay, works badly. 
and has poisoned politics, public morals, and social intercourse in the Republic, now for many years. What were Voltaire's religious views? Voltaire rejected the wager of the brilliant 17th century mathematician Blaise Pascal, 1623 to 1662. The following passage from Pascal's Pensees constitutes the famous wager, God is, or he is not. But to which side shall we incline? Reason can decide. Nothing here. There is an infinite chaos which separated us. A game is being played at the extremity of this infinite distance where heads or tails will turn. Up. Which will you choose then? Let us see. Since you must choose. Let us see which interests you least. You have two things to lose, the true and the good, and two things to stake, your reason and your will. Your knowledge and your happiness, and your nature has two things to shun, error and misery. Your reason is no more shocked in choosing one rather than the other. Since you must of necessity choose but your happiness. Let us weigh the gain and the loss in. Wagering that God is. If you gain, you gain all, if you lose, you lose nothing. Wager, then, without hesitation that he is. In other words, if we don't know whether God exists, we have two choices. We can base our life on the premise that he is. In that case, if he exists, we will go to heaven. But suppose he doesn't exist? It's still better to bet that he is, because if he isn't, we lose nothing. Whereas, if we bet that he isn't and he isn't, we are merely confirmed in our misery, but if he turns out to exist, we go to hell when we die. Voltaire would have none of this. Voltaire believed that the design evident in nature was proof of God's existence, as first cause, prime mover, and supreme intelligence. How can a benevolent and omnipotent God permit evil to exist? Voltaire was very distressed by the Lisbon earthquake and tidal wave that struck on All Saints Day in 1755, killing thousands. In his poem Sir L.E. Disaster to Lisbon, 1755, he rejected both Leibnizian optimism and the doctrine of original sin. He concluded that all humans can do is accept such evil and continue to worship. In Tzadig and other writings his sense of religious awe was further stressed. He maintained an attitude of tolerance for the rest of his life, with ongoing interests in the teachings of Confucius and the Quakers. In his final years, Voltaire overtly attacked the Catholic Church for its intolerance. He proclaimed, those who can make you believe absurdities, can make you commit atrocities. What is sense knowledge? Sense knowledge is information gathered through our senses, such as sight, touch, hearing, and so forth. Did Jonathan Swift go mad?
Some thought he did, based on the scatological and prurient interests that his later writings expressed. For instance, in his 1732 poem The Lady's Dressing Room, after morbidly describing a long list of disgusting physical effluvia from a woman's process of cleaning, grooming, dressing, and applying makeup, he wrote at the end, disgusted Strephon stole away slash repeating in his amorous fits. Slash oh. Celia, Celia, Celia shits. At the same time, Swift also wrote another strange poem. A beautiful young nymph going to bed, which is about a woman who repulsively removes all the parts of herself, including prostheses, that made her seem attractive. Swift apparently had an obsession about the falseness of women. Although he was a priest in the Anglican Church, he had a 17 year love affair with Esther Van Humry. A former Tutti, whom he rejected for the younger Esther Johnson, known in his writings as Stella. Esther Van Humry, or Vanessa to Swift, was the friend who left money to George Berkeley, 1685 to 1783. She died soon after Swift finally rejected her. Esther Johnson also died young. In 1742, Swift was pronounced of unsound mind and memory, incapable of looking after himself or his affairs. When Swift died in 1745, he left his estate to found an insane asylum. But he was apparently not insane from psychological causes. Rather, he had labyrinthine vertigo, known as Meniere's disease. A physiological ailment that was not well understood in his day. His final words were, I am a fool. Swift's Latin epitaph reads in English, when savage indignation can no longer torture the heart. Proceed, traveler, and, if you can, imitate the strenuous avenger of noble liberty. What was Protagoras famous for? Protagoras of Abdira in Thrace, c. 490-420 BCE, was the most acclaimed of all the sophists. Plato wrote that he was the first sophist to call himself a sophist. He trained young men for politics and was friends with the statesman Pericles, c. 495-429 BCE, who asked him to write a constitution for the new colony of Thurai. He was a productive writer, and his works included On Truth, on the gods, and anti-logic, none of which have survived to this day. Protagoras was the author of the humanistic credo man is the measure of all things. Of all things that are, that they are and of things that are not that they are not. Protagoras held that the soul is nothing above or beyond a person's perceptions. His relativism was based on the different perceptual experiences of different individuals. For instance, what is cold to one person may seem warm to another. And he extended the relativism of individual experience to large groups in claiming that whatever is just to a city is just for that city so long as it seems so. However, although all perceptions and ideas of justice are true. 
According to Protagoras, he thought that some were better than others. He felt that it was the job of the sophist to change people's minds. So that they had better ideas about what was just and beautiful. The better perceptions and ideas were those that had better consequences. In other words, the sophists taught their clients how to succeed.